Finals SAQ77, Mitral Stenosis in Pregnancy A 27-year-old woman is 13 weeks pregnant. In the antenatal clinic, she is found to have an asymptomatic heart murmur. Subsequent echocardiogram shows moderate to severe mitral stenosis. A. List the causes of mitral stenosis. Causes include rheumatic fever, which is the commonest cause worldwide but less common in developed countries. Uncommon causes of MS include infective endocarditis, congenital heart disease, degenerative calcification, rheumatoid arthritis, endomyocardial fibroelastosis, malignant carcinoid syndrome, SLE, Bipole's disease and Fabry disease. B. How do the cardiovascular changes in pregnancy exacerbate the pathophysiology of mitral stenosis? Increased intravascular volume. The fixed output of the left atrium is unable to cope with the increase in intravascular volume seen during pregnancy, leading to pulmonary edema. Increased left atrial stretch predisposes to atrial fibrillation and CVS decompensation. During pregnancy, there is increased heart rate by 25% and increased cardiac output by 50% at term. Increased heart rate leads to shorter diastolic time, reducing time for blood flow across the stenotic valve, leading to reduced left ventricular filling and reduced cardiac output. Cardiac output increases during pregnancy to cope with the 40% increase in oxygen consumption caused by the fetus and increased maternal metabolism. This increase in cardiac output cannot be facilitated with a significantly stenosed valve, leading to reduced exercise tolerance, dyspnea and cyanosis. SVR reduces by 40% during pregnancy, leading to reduced coronary artery perfusion and risk of myocardial ischemia. Aortocaval compression by the pregnant uterus leads to reduced venous return and cardiac output. Cardiac output is reduced further by mitral stenosis due to the above-mentioned effects. C. Outline the specific management issues when she presents in established labor. Delivery location. This should be decided antenatally as she presented early in pregnancy. The patient should deliver at a maternal level 4 care center with capabilities of managing an urgent valvotomy or valve replacement as she is MWHO class 3 to 4. Delivery mode should be decided antenatally as she presented early in pregnancy. There should be early communication between senior anesthetist, senior obstetrician, cardiologist, cardiothoracic surgeon, midwifery team, and the patient. Anesthesiology considerations. Hemodynamic goals include low to normal heart rate, to balance myocardial oxygen supply and demand by maintaining afterload and avoiding tachycardia, keep the circulation slow and tight. Normal sinus rhythm, arrhythmias must be treated promptly or hemodynamic collapse may ensue. Consider the role of defibrillation. Adequate preload, but avoid fluid overload which may precipitate acute pulmonary edema. Ensure cross-match blood is available as the patient tolerates volume loss poorly and needs replacement with fluids that has oxygen carrying capacity. Maintain aortic diastolic blood pressure at baseline. Maintain SVR and avoid hypotension. Avoid sudden changes in afterload. Avoid hypercapnia, acidosis, hypothermia, hypoxia, etc., which may exacerbate pulmonary hypertension. Maintain contractility of the heart. Inotropic support may be required. Anesthetic plan. Carefully titrated neuraxial analgesia or anesthesia is preferred. A vaginal delivery with effective neuraxial analgesia is the preferred mode of delivery for most patients with cardiovascular disease in pregnancy. GA or slow onset central neuraxial blockade have both been advocated if the patient undergoes caesarean section. If a pregnant patient with cardiovascular disease is dyspneic or hypoxic and cannot lie supine before caesarean delivery, then GA with intubation may be indicated to prepare for potential cardiopulmonary decompensation immediately after delivery. The anesthetic technique is probably less important than the skill which it is applied. Effective analgesia avoids catecholamine-induced tachycardia and hypertension. For MS complicated with atrial fibrillation, the patient may be on anticoagulants which may contraindicate neuraxial techniques. To avoid spinal epidural hematoma, Neuraxial techniques should be timed according to the anticoagulation medication and dose. Access Usual large bore peripheral IV lines. Insertion of a central venous line allows for reliable administration of vasoconstrictors and inotropes. 
vaginal delivery, airway and respiratory. Monitoring includes oxygen saturations, breathing pattern and rate, monitor for signs of acute pulmonary edema, etc. Provide adequate oxygen support, avoid nitrous oxide, hypoxia and hypercapnia, which may increase pulmonary vascular resistance. Cardiovascular. Monitoring includes intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring is beneficial. Neuraxial analgesia-related hypotension should be managed promptly with alpha agonists. ECG. Tachycardia and loss of sinus rhythm are deleterious to cardiac output and should be managed accordingly. Blood loss. The patient tolerates volume loss poorly and need replacement with fluids that has oxygen carrying capacity. Monitor for effects of autotransfusion after delivery. Consider transthoracic echocardiography or point-of-care cardiac ultrasound. Treatment IV fluids is indicated if the patient is dehydrated due to poor intake in labour. Maintain left atrial filling. Avoid excessive fluids to avoid pulmonary edema. Transfuse blood products in hemorrhagic shock. Left lateral tube to ensure unobstructed venous return due to aortocaval compression. Vessel presses are important in patients with severe MS as they have a fixed cardiac output and cannot compensate for reduced SVR, which may lead to hypotension and myocardial ischemia. Neurological. Early epidural to avoid sympathetically mediated tachycardia. Cautious top-ups to avoid drop in SVR. Alpha agonist use as necessary. Pharmacology. Syntocinone or pitocin to be given as an infusion rather than a bolus to avoid tachycardia and vasodilation. Ergometrin is contraindicated as it increases pulmonary vascular resistance. Obstetric. Continuous fetal monitoring. Fetal distress may be an indicator of poor maternal hemodynamics. Consider instrumental delivery during the second stage to avoid maternal effort as the associated Valsava maneuver will reduce venous return. Caesarean delivery, airway and respiratory, monitoring as above, provide adequate supplemental oxygen and avoid factors that increase PVR. Cardiovascular, monitoring includes IABP, ECG, monitoring for blood loss, effects of autotransfusion after delivery, and consideration of echocardiography. Treatment with IV fluids, vasopressors, and inotropes as appropriate. Left lateral tube avoids aortocaval compression. Neurological. Optimum mode of anesthesia is slowly titrated central neuraxial block such as slow epidural top-up, combined spinal and epidural with low-dose spinal component, or rarely CSA. Pharmacology. Cardiac induction if general anesthesia is employed. Ensure adequate opioid dose at induction to obtain the pressure response and at a dose that obviates the need for high-dose hypnotic agent. Pediatrician should be alerted if opioids are given. Phenylephrine infusion to maintain SVR without inducing tachycardia. Avoid drugs that make tachycardia likely, such as atropine. Short-acting beta blockers may be necessary. Syntocinone should be given as an infusion rather than bolus. Obstetric considerations. Early consideration of b lynch suture, intrauterine balloon or hysterectomy if excessive bleeding as blood loss is poorly tolerated and pharmacological options are limited. Ergometrin causes increased PVR and hypertension. Prostaglandins may cause bronchospasm and precipitate pulmonary edema. Recovery. Consider ICU for high risk. Comments. 65.5% pass rate. Cardiovascular impact or hemodynamic changes of stenotic valve disease. Left-sided valvular obstruction limits the ability to provide adequate cardiac output in the setting of low SVR state of pregnancy. Severe mitral stenosis and severe symptomatic aortic stenosis remains high-risk lesions for which pregnancy is contraindicated. Patients with severe left-sided heart obstruction are at risk of poor cardiac output, congestion, heart failure, and arrhythmias. Post-delivery autotransfusion may exacerbate this physiology. Serial echocardiography is often used for assessment. Mitral valve stenosis. Etiology has been discussed in the previous section. Pathophysiology. Mitral stenosis causes underfilling of the left ventricle and increased pressure and volume upstream of the valve. Pulmonary vascular pressures are initially maintained by left atrial dilation. As disease progresses, 
increased pulmonary artery pressure leads to reactive pulmonary vasoconstriction and pulmonary hypertension. Adaptive right ventricular hypertrophy fails to compensate for volume and pressure overload, leading to progressive right ventricular dilation and failure. Pressure gradient across the narrow mitral orifice increases with the square of cardiac output. Rapid heart rates, especially with atrial fibrillation, reduces diastolic filling time and cardiac output, and chronic left atrial dilation due to mitral stenosis increases the risk of AF. Intracardiac thrombus, either in the left atrium or left atrial appendage, may develop due to low-velocity blood flow. If present, anticoagulation is required. Critical mitral stenosis is a fixed, low cardiac output state. The patient with mitral stenosis may present with symptoms such as dyspnea, hemoptysis, recurrent bronchitis, fatigue and palpitations. Signs include mitral phases, peripheral cyanosis, signs of right heart failure, tapping apex beat, loud first heart sound, opening snap, low pitch diastolic murmur best heard at the apex. ECG shows P mitrale or AF. Chest X-ray, possible findings includes valve calcification, large left atrium, double shadow behind the heart on PA film, splaying of carina, curly B lines. Echocardiogram is able to assess valve area. Normal mitral valve area is 4 to 6 cm squared. The patient is symptom free until 1.6 to 2.5 cm squared. Moderate stenosis 1 to 1.5 cm squared. Severe stenosis, mitral valve area less than 1 cm squared. Echocardiogram also assesses the gradient, RV function, and intracardiac thrombus. Patients with MS who meets standard criteria should undergo valvular intervention prior to elective surgery, such as open or percutaneous mitral commissurotomy. Aortic stenosis has been discussed in finals SAQ 16. Describe the MWHO risk class for cardio-obstetric patients. Classes include class 1, 2, 3, and 4. Class 1. Examples of cardiovascular conditions include uncomplicated small or mild pulmonary stenosis, PDA, or mitral valve prolapse, successfully repaired simple lesions such as ASD, VSD, PDA, and anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. Atrial or ventricular ectopic beats, isolated. No increased risk of maternal mortality, no or mild increase in morbidity, care at local hospital and delivery at local hospital. Class 2, if otherwise well and uncomplicated, examples include unoperated ASD or VSD, repaired TOF, most arrhythmias, and Turner syndrome without congenital cardiac disease. If otherwise well, then a small increased risk of maternal mortality and moderate increase in morbidity. Considerations, care and delivery at local hospital with pregnancy heart team consultation. Class 2 or 3 depends on individual. Examples include mild LV impairment with EF more than 45%, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, native or tissue valvular heart disease not considered WHO1 or 4, mild mitral stenosis or moderate aortic stenosis, Marfan syndrome or other HTAD without aortic dilation, Aorta less than 45 mm in aortic disease associated with bicuspid aortic valve. Repaired coarctation without residua, non-turner, and AV septal defect. Risk depends whether the patient is class 2 or 3. The pregnancy heart team should be consulted during the management of these patients. Class 3. Examples of CVS conditions of class 3 includes moderate LV impairment with EF 30 to 45%, previous pregnancy with cardiomyopathy without any residual LV impairment, mechanical heart valve, systemic right ventricle with good or mildly decreased ventricular function, fontan circulation uncomplicated, cyanotic heart disease unrepaired, other complex congenital heart disease, moderate mitral stenosis, severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis, moderate aortic dilation, and ventricular tachycardia. There is significantly increased risk of maternal mortality or severe morbidity. Care should be provided at appropriate level hospital with appropriate members of pregnancy heart team available. Examples of class 4 includes pulmonary arterial hypertension of any cause, severe systemic ventricular dysfunction 
with left ventricular EF less than 30%, NIHA FC class 3 or 4. Previous peripartum cardiomyopathy with any residual impairment of LV function, severe mitral stenosis, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, systemic right ventricle with moderate to severely decreased LV function, severe aortic dilation, native severe coarctation, vascular ethyl danlos, and fontan circulation with any complication. There is extremely high risk of mortality and morbidity, and pregnancy is contraindicated. Considerations, care at appropriate level hospital with appropriate members of pregnancy heart team available. These are my references. Thank you.